we have an aging population who are likely to experience this problem over time. The pathophysiology of stable angina and where this pain really comes from is you know, fairly well established. Essentially, there's increased myocardial, myocardial oxygen demand. Maybe there's increased hypertrophy of the left, my, the left ventricle uh, from high blood pressure. There may be increased cardiac work with exertion. And in the presence of a fixed atherosclerotic lesion, there's less oxygen delivery into the heart muscle. And that can generate the sensation of pain because of ischemia in the muscle. When we think about stable ischemic heart disease, particularly in 2020, we need to talk about kind of four key things. The evaluation of ischemia and where we are with that, and some new updates. We need to talk about antiangional therapy and where, where we could do better, as well as revascularization for symptoms and revascularization for survival. We'll start here. This is the world of ischemic evaluation. And the circles and their size represent how much is known about that particular type of evaluation, either non-invasive or invasive. The arrows kind of relate, relate to the relationships of those different types of testing. And some of them are stronger than others. So the arrows are larger. And some of those are weaker or less established and newer. On the non-invasive side, we have a lot of information about just percent stenosis on angiography and how that relates to myocardial perfusion imaging on a nuclear stress test or a treadmill stress test or a stress echo. We have less information, but maybe this is where there's novelty is in the PET myocardial blood flow studies and in CTFFR. And we'll talk about those modalities a little bit. On the invasive side, we have a lot of information about fractional flow reserve and intravascular physiology. We also have kind of two aspects of invasive testing. We have hyperemic testing where we give adenosine typically and vasodilate the microvasculature, but we also can do non-hyperemic testing. And this is kind of a little bit of an emerging concept. And we'll talk about uh, some modalities there. And then we have to kind of integrate all of that ischemic evaluation in our assessment of the patient and their, and their angina. The fractional flow reserve is this ratio across the lesion. It's a ratio of the distal pressure to the proximal pressure. When there's no lesion, everything's equal once you've taken out the contribution of the microvasculature by vasodilation. But when there's a lesion, a fixed stenosis, there can be a pressure drop. And we now know there are very clear cutoffs as to when that lesion is significant from a physiologic perspective and can create um, ischemia. FAME2 uh, gave us a lot of data about how to interpret FFR and what we can expect. FFR positive lesions in stable coronary disease had favorable outcome with PCI. So if you met a certain threshold and you show that the, the lesion was significant from a physiologic standpoint, there was lower um, urgent revascularization, uh, lower um, death NMI in the FFR guided group getting PCI, which is percutaneous coronary inter, um, intervention for the, the uh, general audience here. They also had improvement in the Canadian Cardiovascular Society angina score. What we see is more individuals having less severe angina, lighter green. You know, you see a lot, lot less of the mountain with the PCI group. And that's because they felt better. So does that extend to bypass? Could we use this technique and evaluate the vessels and say, well, let's bypass this vessel and not another one? And that's been looked at in two trials so far, Graffiti and Fargo, and they've been meta-analyzed. So combined and they looked at them together. But actually what it showed is that using this FFR guided approach was no better than just your own eye on the angiogram. And I guess that's kind of surprising. Now that said, it was a small study and it was only followed out for a short period of time. But what we saw was less graphs being put on in general. And um, this is where the state of the art is right now in 2020. We're gonna have to look forward to the future when we get more information from the FAME 3 and SAVE IT trials. And this is still a concept in evolution. We're gonna to have to see where it goes. The other thing that we've seen more recently is emergence of 
the non-hyperemic testing. When you give adenosine, you know, people don't feel so good. They can get bradycardic, they feel a little nauseated, they have chest pain, EKG changes, uh, and, so, and they can have bronchospasm as well if they have reactive airways. So what if we just put the wire across and kind of measured at a certain time frame when the microvasculature wasn't as much of a factor? You know, can't there be some other way of doing this? That's what's been developed is this instantaneous free wave ratio where the resistance is low in a certain wave-free period in diastole. And then we can look at that distal pressure to proximal pressure ratio. And that's been related to FFR as well. It turns out it correlates very well. And it has great diagnostic accuracy, sensitivity, and specificity. FFR, of course, was more related to the non-invasive testing, the other half of the ischemic evaluation universe, as I showed you before. But now we've related, if we relate FFR to non-invasive testing and we've related IFR to FFR, then we're kind of going by extension to, uh, to the non-invasive testing. But that, that hasn't been totally shown, it's just an extrapolation. So now there's been a kind of abundance of non-hyperemic pressure ratios that have been developed. So you, you see other alternatives, you know, different uh, manufacturers wanna offer different options and using different parts of the diastolic pressure um, uh, wave-free moment, but same idea. And the cut points are similar for all three. We use 0.89 for the non-hyperemic ratio as compared to an FFR of 0.80. So if you are below 0.80 on the FFR, that's associated with worse ischemia on the stress testing, worse outcomes. Define flare, and then you know more recently, IFR sweetheart compared IFR and showed that it was non-inferior to FFR. So we could use either one. There were less adverse effects because you don't have all of the adenosine going into the patient. And procedural time was shorter. There's been a real hesitation to perform FFR by you know, some angiographers because it takes more time and then there's more expense. Um, and then you have to interpret what you see. But IFR allows you to put the wire down and not have to add more time. Um, it turns out when you do this, you actually find less functionally significant lesions and you end up performing revascular revascularization less, less frequently. But they seem to have um, similar outcomes, at least at one year, in terms of all-cause death, non-fatal MI, or unplanned revascularization. So you, lose, you use less stents, but they seem to do very well. Well, what if your non-hyperemic pressure ratio and your FFR discordant. So, you know, some of us were not sure what to do with the non-hyperemic measurements, and so we would do both because there was more data about FFR. And I've had this situation. And in that scenario, for my uh, patient, what I did is had a conversation with the referring attending, and we decided that um, deferral based on the FFR, you know, being above 0.80 was probably worthwhile you know, this individual is gonna to go to surgery. It would make a difference if we stented just based on the IFR. So, you know, we went with uh, the FFR result and patient did well. But there is some data here in 2020 to guide us about this scenario. And what this shows us, and this is a small group. So again, we need more information, but the cumulative incidence of events was really the best if they agreed. So if you had two tests that agreed, that was the best. But even when they disagreed and you deferred the lesion, they did okay. They did about as well as a revascularized vessel at five years. So this might provide you some reassurance that you could walk away from a lesion if it was discordant or revascularize it, if it said that, if it indicated that, and if you felt that the patient needed it. So this is where we are in 2020. And of course, stay tuned because I'd like to see more information about that. Well, it would be great to have a non-invasive measurement of FFR. Then I would really know what to do in the cath lab when the patient comes and I'll know ahead of time and I won't have to do it in the lab myself. It would all be worked out. Well, that's you know, in evolution. Uh, CT gives you really great anatomic information. You can see the stenosis. And now with non-invasive FFR, you can actually get these numbers. You still have to vasodilate. You have to have a decent heart rate. 
Um, but it has good short-term clinical outcome data and it does change management. There are some areas where there's less agreement between the invasive FFR and the CT FFR. That's got a little bit of a gray zone and this needs to be further investigated and refined. There are other limitations. You really need to have a good picture. If people have already had work done, then that may, those images are not gonna be suitable. You need significant computational power. And how are we gonna decide what patients are gonna have CTFFR or other modalities? How does it stack up in terms of its uh, performance related to the other modalities that are more familiar, like nuclear stress testing? And what about ischemic burden and viability? We're not gonna have that information or information about the microvasculature, the small blood vessels of the heart. We also are missing some of the randomized controlled trials that we need. Another more recent uh, development in imaging and, and non-invasive measurement of ischemia in 2020 is PET-CT. What's nice about PET-CT is it gives you many different types of data. You, you get perfusion defect, extent, severity, it also tells you about our LV volumes and our EF. So that's all very familiar. It also gives you the advantage of the CT portion because you get the calcification of the plaque. So you can match up the perfusion defect to what you see anatomically. And then if you can get a quantitative myocardial blood flow in different areas, you can really decide whether or not you think those areas are obstructive coronary disease or not. You can differentiate these flow-limiting stenoses versus diffuse atherosclerosis or microvascular dysfunction if there's no coronary calcium. We still need more information on this one, but stay tuned. What about antianginal therapy? Where are we with that in 2020? Well, look at this kind of tried and true medical therapy that we have, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, nitroglycerin. Decades old, we've been using them and they work pretty well. They decrease the myocardial oxygen demand left ventricular wall stress, increased oxygen supply. And the newer addition in the early 2000s was renolazine, which acts in a completely different way and increases glucose oxidation and ATP production. But in an uh, exercise study, it actually improved treadmill performance on top of beta blocker and, and calcium channel blocker. So there's a little data for renolazine as well. That said, in subsequent studies like river PCI, it wasn't that impressive in terms of its ability to, to regulate angina. So, you know, it's maybe a little bit a weak as an antianginal agent. And certainly our patients who are optimized on these agents still break through. Are there alternatives in 2020 that we should be looking into? Well, one of these is Evabradine, which really is um, more used on the heart failure side, but maybe we should consider this as an alternative to beta blocker or adjunctive to other medications and what this does, it kind of slows down the heart rate. Nicorandil is another one uh, which needs more information behind it, but it increases nitric oxide and calcium channel, uh, calcium release, and allows the smooth muscle of the vessels to relax and improves flow. Trimetazidine, similar to renolazine, increases the glucose oxidation and, and the ATP production. All of these can generate some sort of symptom relief. They all have cardiovascular effects in blood pressure and heart rate, but very few have an outcome benefit. And what we should remember is that medical therapy that prevents cardiovascular events doesn't necessarily alleviate symptoms and symptomatic therapy doesn't necessarily improve prognosis. There's actually no superiority of one antianginal over another, even though the guidelines give you these kind of formulaic pathways and it's done on both sides, both in Europe and in and the US, a little differently with different agents, but you know, kind of similar thing. Now in this scheme, you can see there's an attempt to individualize the patient. And that's maybe uh, the best way to think about it. This is a diamond diagram from a consensus of experts who sat down and said, well, you know, angina maybe should be treated based on the different comorbidities that the patient has and what kind of ischemia they have. And there may be some agents that are more preferred and others that we shouldn't give at all. So this is where we stand. We need to tailor the antianginals to the patient and we need to maybe some bigger trials to investigate um, some of the newer uh, modalities.
all, of course, we need to have a background of lifestyle modification. And some of these are underused. We've seen poor uptake of cardiac rehab, high co-pays. So even if it is approved, patients can't get there because it's $50 a, a session. And EECP, I have a non-invasive blood pressure cuff um, um, stimulation that improves um, exercise tolerance and decreases chest pain, but it's very hard to find a center and not available to everyone. Well, there's been a lot of change in revascularization for symptoms in 2020. If we take a step back to courage, what courage showed us was that stents did not reduce the risk of death, MI, cardiovascular events relative to medical therapy. There's overall survival really unchanged over extended follow-up period. And there's MI, same thing. But what it did do was reduce angina. It reduced pain. And that can improve quality of life and treatment satisfaction. And that matters for patients. And that benefit was sustained uh, you know, for, for about two years or so. And those who had more severe chest pain had a greater benefit from having the stents placed. More recently, we've now looked at this orbital trial where we actually have a placebo control, a sham procedure. So everyone came and we had angiograms on everyone and half had intervention and the other half did not. And they were treated with medical therapy. Everybody was treated on a background of medical therapy. And we saw that stents did not increase exercise time versus medical therapy at six weeks. So when we review the types of people that were enrolled were people with normal ventricles for the most part. They tended to have moderate angina, uh, Canadian um, Cardiovascular Society class two or three. Um, and most of that PCI, that was angiographically guided. Now they may have obtained FFR and IFR, but the PCI was really angiographically guided. The authors felt that they needed to show the stenosis um, to prove that, hey, these were real lesions. And they show you the exercise time, really no different uh, on the treadmill at six weeks. This led to some really splashy headlines. Heart stents fail to ease chest pain. Well, at six weeks, it failed to increase exercise time. So what happens beyond six weeks? That's what we need to answer moving forward. And Orbita 2 will extend the period of follow-up. It's gonna look at uh, kind of like a, a middle term, you know, three month mark, but still, you know, chest pain matters to patients and stents can be useful for that. You just have to keep it all in context. But what it does give you is some reassurance that if you wanted to try medical therapy a little longer, or if a patient felt hesitant, or you weren't sure if they would take the aspirin or the other antiplatelet, you could put them on medication and wait a month and that would be okay. Ischemia, this is you know 2020, um, uh, very contemporary information, big study, very long um, enrollment time, uh, thousands of patients, multiple centers, very uh, long awaited, showed that in moderate or severe ischemia, revascularization by either PCI or cabbage did not reduce the risk of death or cardiovascular events versus medical therapy. 75% had stenting and a quarter had bypass. If we kind of drill down, they all went on went these uh, angiograms on the invasive side, uh, but only like a fraction, you know, 80% underwent revascularization. On the, on the conservative strategy arm, there's some crossover. Now, most of the crossover was early. It was like 15% before they had, uh, you know, registered an actual event. Um, but, you know, again, patients care about how they feel. Uh, and some of them in the conservative arm had to cross over. And that's about the same amount that crossed over in Courage, about 15, uh, 16%. Let's look at the composite outcome. So they put together cardiovascular death, MI, hospitalization for unstable angina, heart failure, resuscitated cardiac arrest over about three years. And they looked at the conservative strategy and the invasive strategy. Early on, there's an increase 
in the cumulative instance of these events. Then there's a cross around two years, and then it seems to be maybe a little bit lower on the invasive side in year four and five. Early on, you might expect that there's some periprocedural in line because placement of the scent can embolize material until microvascular tree can get these small in lines. So there were more procedural MIs, but they're of uncertain clinical importance. And as you move beyond that short time frame and get out into four or five years, you're really talking about spontaneous MI and plaque ruptures at that point. Here's death from cardiovascular causes or MI. Here's death from any cause. So really driven by this MI, right? Let's drill down into the definition of MI. How are they adjudicating? How are they deciding that you had an MI or you didn't? There are panels that sit down and decide what defines an MI. And there are universal definitions that are accepted and used in trials and established at the outset so that we can have a uniform protocol of how we're gonna evaluate things. We're all gonna agree on that. So there are different definitions. There's the uh, universal definition of MI has been updated and it's now in its fourth update. But in the third update, which would have been used at this time, um, you can see that there's a difference kind of in how PCI or bypass uh, is uh, adjudicated, okay? So greater than five times the 99th percentile for the PCI, bypass gets a little bit more of a margin um, and troponin is preferred. In the sky definition, CKMB is preferred and the definition is equivalent. So why would that matter? Well, here's an example of a paper where they took multiple trials of PCI and bypass and they compared the different definitions. And they said, well, if I adjudicate the same data and I use different definitions, what kind of incidence of MI am I going to have? And it, will PCI be equivalent to cabbage in all of the definitions or not? In this paper, what they described is that the the incidence of MI was really different according to the different uh, definitions. The third universal of MI being the most likely to kind of match up, but you could see that with the sky definition, there was kind of a higher uh, event rate for the bypass group. These authors in the ischemia trial, if you go into the supplement and you really like scroll down the, you know, the, the, the supplement, you're gonna find a graph where they went back and they looked at it with a third universal definition. They had planned to use a sky definition. They went back and they said, okay, let's just make sure and let's take a look. And you can see the invasive arm uh, doesn't ever cross. It still doesn't change the interpretation, but um, many people when they saw the presentation of ischemia noted that the invasive strategy seemed to have less MI in year four and five. And so that's gonna prompt most likely more long-term follow-up to figure out if those curves really continue to separate and there's a benefit to that invasive strategy. But if we use this other definition, you can see that they don't have that, that crossing of the curves. Regardless, this also led to some major statements. Surgery for blocked arteries is often unwarranted, but let's remember there are moments where we need to revascularize for survival, and we're going to talk about that. Ischemia did show, however, consistent with courage, consistent with a lot of data, we saw improved quality of life for those who had uh, stenting, especially if you had worse anginate baseline. Your probability of being anginate free over time, and this is sustained now after three years, uh, was much, much higher if you had had the upfront invasive strategy. And of course, if you had more frequent angina and more severe angina, uh, you got a bigger benefit. And there were a decent number of people who didn't have angina in the previous month uh, in this study. So it's hard to improve on the no angina people. What about people with chronic kidney disease? This is a, tends to be a group, they're very much excluded from a lot of our trials. Uh, there was no difference between the invasive or the conservative strategy in the chronic kidney disease group. They had a very high incidence of events in the first three years. And this was a composite of death or non-fatal MI. In the invasive arm, they had a higher stroke rate and they had a higher rate of death or initiation of dialysis. And those are not surprising. Um, invasive therapies are associated with some risk of stroke and the exposure to dye or the hemodynamic changes of bypass though can also prompt initiation of dialysis in someone who's almost there. What's interesting to me, and maybe I'd like to know more about is what about the degree of baseline ischemia? When people had more severe ischemia, 
seem to be that the invasive strategy might be a little bit better, but this is underpowered. It's a subgroup analysis and we can't be sure, but it is hypothesis generating. And I'd really like to know if we should approach those individuals in a, a different way. That said, the, the position of this study, you know, kind of plays into all these people who come to us for renal transplant evaluation. We have a lot of people who come and they're going to have, uh, you know, the opportunity to be listed. And old data tells us that their coronary disease um, in, by, in transplant progresses. It tends to be associated with worse outcomes. So we tend to be more aggressive with those individuals. But what this is showing us is at least at three years, there's really no difference if we had sent to them or didn't, bypassed them or didn't. That, you know, is something we're going to have to think about with our uh, pre-transplant evaluation individuals. And, um, you know, this is food for thought and for further study. What about CTO, chronic total occlusion? Do you see these vessels in panel A? It doesn't look like anything's there, but people can have chest pain from this because they're kind of underserved. That whole area may be underserved with little micro channels, which we call collaterals. And there are more techniques than ever to open these up now. Ischemia will actually have a CTO study, but it's not out yet. So what do we know in 2020? Well, we have some updated data. There's better quality of life. And do you see the theme? No difference in major adverse cardiovascular events with the CTO PCI. The success rate for this study was incredibly high. Uh, the trial was stopped for slow enrollment. And look at the crossover. People who were randomized really just didn't wanna be. There was a crossover within three days. It said, take care of my chest pain. And the quality of life was improved across the board for both groups. So. Being enrolled in the trial can sometimes uh, give you uh, this effect, and that's why it's important to compare. <coughs> EuroCTO. Similarly, EuroCTO showed improvement in quality of life across parameters of physical limitation, angina frequency, quality of life with comparable adverse events. Look at the Canadian cardiovascular score angina. <coughs> Blue and green, this is where you want to live. <clears throat> and more people at follow-up were in the blue and green zone. Again, you know, these are groups that are very skilled. They're, um, you know, achieving great technical success. And that you have to keep in mind because these can be very challenging to deal with. That said, CTO-PCI does not necessarily change left ventricular function. There were, in this study, they actually used cardiac MRI to measure left ventricular volumes and ejection fractions, so really good measure. And they looked at segmental wall thickening and regional wall motion, but they didn't really see a difference in those parameters. They did have more target vessel revascularization in the people who didn't get the stenting up front. You know, people come back. When you have chest pain, it's not well controlled with our current medical therapy. They come back to your doorstep. What about calcification in 2020? So what you see in this panel or in this picture is an angiogram. These are the coronary arteries. And they're areas that are really dark and, and they're areas that are really kind of gray or look a little lucent. Well, those are areas that are calcified. Those areas, they build up over time. And this is really challenging to deal with. And it's more common than ever. More than a third of patients presenting for PCI have moderate or severe coronary artery calcification. With older age, this is going to rise. We have more tools now. Um, this is an old tool, rotational atherectomy, and this is a procedure to deal with distal left main bifurcation, LAD. You can see this is a drill. It's rotating 150,000 RPM with a diamond bit on the end and basically kind of pulverizing the calcification to try and remove it and then open up the blood vessel. And that works pretty well for some individuals. We also have orbital atherectomy, which is a, a different device, a little newer device studying the orbital studies. And this device, it's almost like a jump rope, kind of spins like a jump rope and shaves away the, the calcification, pulverizes it, and then we can open up the blood vessel. We know more about coronary calcification and its pathophysiology. 
These, uh, these start out as extracellular vesicles that coalesce into microcalcifications, and they're often located in areas of low collagen. This is where that matrix metalloproteinase digests out all the collagen, and then calcification deposits there. And if you notice, it's at the shoulders of the fibrous cap, so it could be destabilizing the fibrous cap, which can lead to acute coronary events because that's where it ruptures. Eventually, over time, these microcalcifications coalesce and they form macrocalcification. And it's the macrocalcification that can be really stabilizing and it can go, sit there for years, but eventually it becomes flow limiting, like you saw with some of those images. What's new? Well, in 2020, we have intravascular lithotripsy as an up and coming emerging concept. It's the same idea as if you were treating a kidney stone. You have a balloon with an emitter inside of it. That balloon goes into the blood vessel. We hook up the back end to a generator and deliver a shock wave. That shock wave creates fatigue and splitting of the calcium. If you look on these images in the lower right hand corner, what I'm showing you is intravascular imaging. So a picture from inside the blood vessel up close. This is optical coherence tomography. If you look at the bottom left of that image, you'll see this area that's kind of, looks like a little mountain. That's the calcium that's grown into the blood vessel. And you go to the right hand, you know, post uh, lithotripsy picture in the upper, the second picture on the upper right, uh, kind of upper middle, all of a sudden you see these cracks that's indicated by the arrow. And that's the fracturing of the calcification. That's how you know that the lithotripsy was successful. And then you can expand the stent inside the artery, and open up the lumen. So you can see the final result is much better. There are two studies published here, DISRUPT 1 and DISRUPT 2, which established the efficacy, the safety, kind of the parameters of this device. If you compare it to what's currently available with rotational atherectomy, orbital atherectomy, so far so good, low perforation, doesn't really have this bradycardic uh, effect. Um, we think it can penetrate deeper into the wall and get a deeper calcium. And we are leading up to the presentation of DISRUPT-3. This is gonna be the pivotal trial. Um, we're going to see if that leads to FDA approval. So stay tuned, six days. Also new this year, we saw more progress on the imaging, um, intravascular ultrasound, Here's a five-year study that looked at um, uh, a, a thousand plus patients, long lesions that were guided with um, intravascular ultrasound to place the stents. And what we see there is that with these uh, modality of guidance, you have more post dilatation, bigger lumens, and less return for restenosis. Because sometimes you can get restenosis when the stent is a little underexpanded or a little malopposed. It might look good to your eye, but when you get into the blood vessel, it looks like it could be a little bit bigger. And we consistently see the same message in our intravascular imaging studies. Consistently see bigger lumen, more post dilatation balloons, um, and less target lesionary vascularization. And you can see that here with the IVIS guidance being 31 versus 55 on the angiographic. And that's what really is driving the whole the whole thing. Um, one study that came out recently, single center, uh, randomized, small but interesting. They randomized to either physiology, FFR, or to optical coherence tomography imaging, like I had showed you. And we had talked about FFR before. So, you know, can't we just use either one? Are they different? When uh, FFR was used, there was actually more medical therapy used, less kidney injury because you walk away. You're not gonna give contrast. And it was less expensive, less stents. When you use the OCT, they were more often going to be treated with a stent, uh, more often had exposure to contrast. But then they had slightly better chest pain relief because they, you know, they had more stenting. And you can see that significant uh, kind of endpoint was a conglomeration of all of these different other smaller endpoints. You know, obviously we need more information. It's a small study, um, single center, um, but you know, OCT and FFR might become combined and maybe we could get the benefit of both. 
when I think about why FFR might also be less of an advantage is just remember, you're still losing your eye to deliver the stent. So you're more likely to have that slight underexpansion or that slight malopposition. And so that stent may not perform as well. So having that imaging modality with the FFR gives you both the intervascular physiology and the imaging. Well, now that we've revascularized, how long do we continue DAPT? How low can we go? We've talked about you know, extended DAPT, that's uh, you know, kind of established, but what about if we go lower? This meta-analysis looked at six trials, 11,000 patients, over half with stable coronary disease, compared six months and one year. In, uh, um, in this uh, kind of uh, figure, what I'm trying to get at is that the bleeding is better when you have less exposure to these antiplatelet therapies. And they don't seem to be uh, risking more MI or clotting of the stent. That's also borne out to three months. Now, there may be a reason to go longer if the individual had an acute coronary syndrome. But you think the thrombus is part of the pathophysiology of that acute coronary syndrome. So they may need a more powerful antiplatelet strategy than the stable individuals. But the three-month dual antiplatelet was not associated with the higher rate of MI or stent thrombosis in the stable group. And that's very interesting. Can we go lower? Can I get one month? Leaders free. One month of dual antiplatelet in the context of either a drug-coated stent with a, kind of a different drug that we, that we don't use in the US, it's a different stent we don't use here, and um, a, a bare metal stent. This study showed that there was better safety with the drug-coated stent than with the bare metal stent and less target lesion revascularization less bleeding on both sides because of the one month, but there's the safety endpoint. The drug coded stent won out, even one with one month of dual antiplatelet therapy was more efficacious and less stent and equivocal stent thrombosis. So benefit and less thrombosis, less major bleeding, maintained out to two years. That's the two year follow-up. Very interesting. Here's stop dap two. Same idea, one month of dual antiplatelet therapy, then they switched to Plavix, and that was not inferior to 12 months of DAP. They had actually less composite events, and they had less bleeding. What's really interesting is look at the hesitation in the physicians, and look at the hesitation in the patients. They were uncomfortable with this concept. But look at the benefit that we're revealing by doing this important research. And now 2020 arrives and we have Onyx 1, one month of dual antiplatelet therapy for a stent that's available in the US, the Resolute Onyx stent. Same thing versus this BioFreedom that was studied in Leaders Free. Uh, same kind of idea of the monotherapy afterwards, but it could be aspirin or Plavix. Looking at the outcomes, Resolute Onyx looks really good. One month adapt, here we are. Equivocal bleeding. Look at this, low stent thrombosis. And this has now led to the announcement last week, look how current we are, that the Resolute Onyx is approved for one month that. This is very exciting. And all because of the uh, you know, gracious volunteerism of our physicians and our patients. But let's say, what do we do for the refractory angina population? There are people who still have chest pain and they're troublesome. We've tried to optimize everything and we can't seem to get them comfortable. What do we have? And I wanna talk about one study that was, uh, had a sham control because that's the best kind of study, right? The COSERA trial improved quality of life and the Canadian Cardiovascular Society score in refractory angina. This is a totally novel device. It's a nitinol mesh that you implant into the coronary sinus and it creates some back pressure and it improves the dwell time so that you have more time to pull out oxygen into the myocardium and the quality of life significantly improved. That's what it looks like on a, on a CAT scan. And here's the quality of life score. People started out with this really moderate or severe debilitating angina and at six months of follow-up, 
they shifted down to a lower grade of chest pain. Now there was no difference in exercise time or wall motion index. Um, it didn't change you know, function as far as we can tell. But, and there was no difference in major adverse cardiovascular events, but improved quality of life. So here we have a new device that we should study and move forward um, to look at could we use a device to improve angina? That's interesting. The spectrum of angina that we've talked about is bigger than just epicardial atherosclerosis. It also includes vasospasm and microvascular angina. We've spent a lot of time working on this. That's where most of the RCTs are. But this is the fact. Microvascular angina is probably occurring more frequently in our patients. And what are we going to do about it? Well, epicardial coronary disease is but the tip of the iceberg. We're ignoring everything underneath the surface if we're just focusing on the epicardial coronaries. We have invasive coronary assessment for ischemia with normal coronary arteries. And the pros of doing this kind of invasive assessment is to really get a good diagnosis, stratify their risk, because if they have it, you know, they have poor, worse prognosis. And if they don't, it might be able to guide us towards certain treatment or others. But even more important, we need more trials in this area. And if we can define this population properly, then we can actually study things very efficaciously and we'll understand better whether it's applicable or not to microvascular chest pain. There are some cons because, you know, who are we going to pick for um, this kind of invasive assessment? Are we gonna took, look at all vessels? Are we gonna do measurements in all territories? That's gonna add time. That's gonna add expense. I'm exposing patients to anticoagulation, guides, wires. That needs to be worked out. This is what we know about invasive coronary assessment for ischemia with normal coronary arteries. We have fractional flow reserve that really does the epicardial coronary. We also have something called coronary flow reserve that combines what's going on in the epicardial coronary and what's going on in the microvasculature. That has an established cutoff normal above two. If we look downstream and we really want to get just into the, the myocardial, you know, sorry, the, the micro, that micro uh, vasculature, then we're really talking about the index of microcirculatory resistance. And that has a cutoff as well, which is less than 25. So how do we measure that? We use a, a wire that has pressure and uh, temperature sensing, and it's like doing a cardiac output down the, the coronary. So we measure under a condition of hyperemia. And so we're trying to vasodilate that microvasculature and we're, we're injecting saline and we're just seeing how long it takes to run down the vessel. And if it takes a really long time and you've tried to vasodilate these vessels, there's something wrong and your index may be off. So this is just showing you that it's that um, distal pressure times the, the, the mean hyperemic transit time and, and there's our, our, our cutoff. But we need to establish some of the outcomes. We need to figure out how to use this and in whom we use it. Some recent information comparing coronary flow reserve in men and women. Women are known to have microvascular angina more frequently than men. Um, it looks like the resting coronary, the, excuse me, that the coronary flow reserve in general may be slightly lower in women than in men. And the index of microcirculatory resistance seems to have less of this sex-based difference. The, the coronary flow reserve may have different implications by sex. So men who had a low coronary flow reserve, not a good microvasculature, had worse cumulative incidence of events than uh, men or women with varying levels of, of CFR. So there seems to be some sex-based difference with the CFR. Uh, it be interesting to pursue more information and, and studies about IMR so there's more to come on this, but we have to make it easier to use. We've got to figure out the answers to some of those pros and cons. But once we've established a diagnosis, uh, we can try different medical therapy depending on what we find. So if we have vasospasm and it's epicardial, the big arteries, sometimes you can just see that with injection of dye. You can give acetylcholine challenges. You can give calcium channel blocker and nitro nitroglycerin. If it's microvasculature, we could try that um, but there are newer trials that are going to look at endothelin-1 receptor antagonists. That's new. And we're going to see what happens with, with those studies. Is this going to be a new agent that we could use for angina? We can increase coronary perfusion, maybe change endothelial function. 
uh, there's some question about whether ACE inhibitors can help or gabardine. So you see there's a lot of data that we have yet to accumulate for the microvasculature. And we also have our friend renolazine that we can try. Lastly, I wanna talk about revascularization for survival. We have 10 year data that's been published from Syntax. This looked at bypass versus PCI and they tried to grade the severity of the disease. No mortality benefit, bypass above PCI except in three vessel disease. Look at that, probability of death over five to 10 years. And they looked at a subgroup analysis. It's really the three vessel disease that benefit the most. And it looks like a trend towards the more complex disease, which kind of makes sense. The Excel trial was also published recently, looking at left main, low or intermediate complexity left main coronary disease, randomized to bypass or to stenting, and determined equivalence in terms of death, stroke, or MI. This was the, the primary outcome. Now, some interesting things came out of this study. Remember what we were talking about with the definition of MI. Look early on. Look at the red line early on. There's a big spike, and then the curves cross, right? So bypass has this early uptick in events. And the definition they used here was the sky definition, not the third universal definition of MI. And I've already shown you that, you know, again, we can have differences, and the messages can be different, the interpretation. Okay, and uh, revascularization was actually more frequent with PCI than with bypass. Death was slightly higher in the PCI, but it wasn't significant. And it was actually driven by non-cardiovascular causes when they kind of drilled down into it and saw more cancer. But this led to a lot of controversy, particularly about how they adjudicated the definition of MI and whether that definition had changed midstream. And there was kind of contention that it had changed and that it wasn't the, the, the definition that should have been used. And it set up a sta the stage for bypass to look worse than sensing. And this created a lot of discussion and heated controversy um, with, um, um, on both sides. But the data is the data. You know, all we can do is expect that the published protocol was respected and this is how they did it. And in this condition, in this study, this is the interpretation. Now Noble, they, um, um, they eliminated that periprocedural MI. They took that out of the definition. So here, bypass was superior to PCI. And that was driven by um, non-procedural MI repeat revascularization. You know, when you have stents, you tend to come back because other vessels will progress. But there was no difference in mortality, uh, just a difference in uh, repeat revascularization and the non-procedural MI. So how do, we do, how do we deal with this? How do we deal with all of this, uh, this data? How do we put it together? In 2017, we had a consensus with appropriate use criteria. We can come back to that, it's still relevant. Use a heart team approach. Everybody gets together, we look at the films, we think about what the patient wants and calculate uh, the syntax, look at the STS score for the surgical risk and make a judgment and ask the patient, what would you prefer? It may be reasonable to use PCI for, especially for those low or intermediate syntax score left mains. And certainly in patients who have multivessel disease or diabetes, it's very reasonable to choose bypass over PCI. We know that really from freedom and other BARI trials, right? Diabetes, multivessel disease, really best treated with bypass. Maybe at an expense of stroke, but mortality and survival is better. And here's the, the stroke data. It's early for the bypass group. Um, there's more MI in that PCI group. And then the repeat revascularization really, uh, you know, you can see that in the stenting group and that's very familiar. To wrap it up, 2020 was quite a year. And I know we're all looking forward to 2021. This year really shed light with COVID-19 on the kind of inequities and systemic disparities that we have in our healthcare system. And we can't talk about stable ischemic heart disease without having a little discussion on disparities. There's a, a meta-analysis of 10 PCI trials 
which looked at racial disparities and outcomes after PCI. And what did this show? First off, look at how many people are enrolled in each subgroup. Does that reflect the population in which these devices are used? Additionally, why are there trials that are published in major journals that do not report race ethnicity at all? Why do we have no subgroup analyses? Because we don't have power. Additionally, why do we have lumping of certain groups where we should have maybe a further re you know, refinement of race ethnicity? So for example, in the Hispanic group, we don't know if these are white or black Hispanic. And in the Asian group, we don't know if these are East Asian, South Asian, both. And there are different cardiometabolic risk profiles in different race ethnicities. Different um, uh, data could be gleaned if we could establish um, these kind of uh, more refined definitions. But what this meta-analysis showed is that black individuals enrolled in these PCI trials had worse outcomes than white individuals and Asian individuals had better outcomes. Why this is needs to be further studied. There's also disparities in treatment by sex. We know that women present at an older age with more atypical symptoms. They're less likely to be referred for non-invasive testing and the testing may have different accuracy in women. Additionally, they're less likely to receive guideline-based intervention and medical therapy. Most trials don't achieve more than 30% women enrolled, yet they're 50% of the population. And that limits subgroup analysis, because again, we're missing the power to look at small differences by sex in some of these devices that are being broadly used by all. Well, that concludes my talk and that's our hour. Thank you very much for joining me. I think we've made huge progress in 2020. We've learned so much and come so far. And I think our patients are gonna really benefit from all of this new information. And we have so many more questions that we need to answer in 2021. Thank you very much. Anna, thank you. That was wonderful and a great overview. And I especially like the way you wrapped it up. Just I'm. I'm going to save my questions for later because there were a few in the chat, but uh, I just wanted to make one quick comment since you brought up the disparity. Yeah, it was wonderful. And the, a great uh, overview. And I especially like the way you wrapped it up. Just I'm, I'm going to save my questions for later because there were a few in the chat, but uh, I just wanted to make one quick comment since you brought up the disparity. Yeah, it was wonderful. And the a great uh, overview. The um, like ischemia the trial up. actually. Uh, I'm was criticized for only enrolling in four percent African American. I wanted to make one quick comment. Applying it to our population may be difficult. The disparity that is wonderful. The great overview. The ischemia trial actually was criticized for only enrolling in four percent African American. I wanted to make one quick comment. Applying it to our population may be difficult. The disparity that is wonderful. The great overview. The ischemia trial actually. Was I'm getting a repetitive echo. The ischemia trial actually was criticized for percent African American. I'm getting a repetitive echo. The ischemia trial actually. Well, I can answer one of the questions and talk over this repetitive echo. Okay, so uh, one of the questions, uh, when would you in consider invasive provocation testing for coronary spasm? We don't do it. You know, we don't do it in this lab. And I don't think we do it in many labs. There is a protocol that's been published and there are places that have worked on that. Uh, I think people are nervous. You know, they're nervous about inducing spasm. Sometimes we see it spontaneously just with injection of dye or engagement of a guide. Um, sometimes we see, you know, EKG changes, patient has chest pain, and then you can say, okay, this is a vasospastic angina. Um, 
Additionally, if you gave a number of people who were normal um, an agent, might you then get some false positives as well? So um, this may be why people feel reluctant because we're not trying to provoke chest pain and, and spasm in the, in the cath lab. Um, there may be a lot of reluctances, a reluctance to that. So it's gonna take more convincing from people who do it to show the community how they use it and how safe it is and how beneficial to the patients. It, hopefully we're not echoing anymore. This was very commonly done not that many years ago when we had ergonavine available. Um, we would very carefully do an angiogram to make sure the patient truly had normal appearing coronaries before we, we gave ergonavine. And then we would test intravenously to see if there was focal spasm. Uh, ergonavine given to a normal individual will cause a, a diminution in, in coronary tone, but it's diffuse. Um, focal spasm can be provoked with ergonomy, but unfortunately it's not available anymore. Uh, so this, we, we used to do this quite a bit uh, to answer Leandro's question, but without ergonomy, it's a little bit tougher. Some people are doing it with acetylcholine. Um, and we have been talking about doing that now that you has joined us uh, in the lab. So that's something we're, we're actually considering right now. Let me ask you a question. <clears throat> Anna, uh, this <clears throat> was a wonderful presentation, very complete, very comprehensive. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the most comprehensive overviews in this topic that I've seen in a long time. Um, obviously, the, the major uh, you know, puzzle that we have um, in the last year has been the results of this chemia trial. <clears throat> and um, you know, there are so many things that I could comment and, or question about that. Uh, starting by um, my agreement with you that there is a bias in enrollment also in these trials. I ha can tell you I was in the committee that censor events for three years, and I might have censored, you know, probably 500 events. And I will tell you the majority of these events came from sites that have low volume of uh, PCI, um, a lot of sites that are out of the country, whereas the largest uh, centers that do high volume PCI, the largest academic centers in New York, including uh, NYU, had a relatively small enrollment. Uh, and I wonder if that, uh, but one thing that, that really puzzled me the most, uh, really puzzled me the most about the result is that uh, if you look at one of the tables, um, there seemed that there's no difference at all between the patients who had mild ischemia versus those that had moderate ischemia or severe ischemia in terms of modulating uh, the impact of uh, percutaneous uh, or revascularization or, or surgery versus uh, OMT. Uh, you know, we're saying that ischemia doesn't really matter, that basically you have CAD and, and you intervene and ischemia or no ischemia, uh, the chance is about the same. I don't know if you have any comment about that. Right, and, and how does someone have moderate or severe ischemia but no angina within the past month? That also is puzzling. What does that mean? Well, I can't improve their quality of life, which is the strength of PCI, and I'm not impacting on their mortality. So, we're, you know, it's surprising, right? It's a puzzling thing. One thing we did many years ago was participated in the ASIP trial, which was the asymptomatic cardiac ischemia pilot. And it was, it was a strangely designed uh, pilot study, but we looked at ischemia based on Holter monitoring and ST segment analysis. And there was a tremendous amount of silent ischemia, patients that had no symptoms, but yet had a lot of ischemia on Holter. Um, and treating them actually, at least in the pilot, seemed to suggest that they had a better outcome. For some reason, that never translated into a large trial. And I don't know why. This was many, this is way back in the 90s. So, you know, it, well, you, this area needs to be looked at, clearly. You point out a, a very interesting problem. How come these patients don't have ischemia? It's a very simple answer. A uh, patient comes to your uh, practice and has uh, severe symptoms, 
um, and you're more likely to say, I'm not going to enroll you in the trial. I'm just going to take it to the lab and, and, uh, and treat you. And if you have minimal symptoms or atypical symptoms or no symptoms and you find disease, you're more likely uh, to enroll the patients in, in the trial. That's one of the limitations uh, of randomized clinical trial is that uh, without a registry um, that look at the patients that were seen at the same time but were not enrolled, not knowing what their outcomes were, um, really ends up not, not answering the question fully. Or maybe we're misunderstanding the contribution of the microvasculature to the positive outcome on the stress test, so that it's not just the epicardial coronary that's giving us the severe ischemia, but the microvasculature, and we're just failing to impact on it with the PCI. One, I just wanted to comment on one of the things you mentioned. Uh, you talked about graffiti and Fargo, which were two small studies uh, that looked at FFR in, in cabbage, and there wasn't really any benefit. Um, I suspect that part of the problem, besides being small trials, is that since all the patients probably got lemas, the 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 benefit of the other graphs is a lot is a lot harder to demonstrate in a small trial. And isn't that interesting? So we want to know more about alternatives to using saphenous skin grafts. We want to know, can we just stent those other lesions? Right. This is such a big question. Right. We're doing this in practice, but we want to have more information about whether or not that's the right approach. And we're, we're lacking a little bit in that data. Um, you know, we've seen some studies of BEMA um, you know, the bilateral internal mammary arteries pulled down, you know, trying to revascularize with more arteries. We need some better um, information about how these things compare to just stent stenting outside of the LAD. Um, and we also know that there's some disadvantage to BEMA. This has been shown with more wound infection and a longer recovery time for certain individuals. There's also uh, the option of robotic um, bypass, which is really interesting to patients because they like this concept of being able to maybe go home quicker and not have a sternotomy to recover. We don't have as much information as we want about that either in terms of how it performs and how that anastomosis um, behaves over the long term as compared to an open surgical approach. So many unanswered questions there and progress to be made. Agreed. Well, if there's no other questions, I want to thank you again. This was a terrific talk, and I'm glad it's going to be posted so others can see it. Very well researched, and uh, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank Learned you. A lot. Learned a lot.